In this second part, I will tell you about the Kelvin cycle in more detail. The basic point of the Kelvin cycle is this. The energy built up from sunlight in the light reactions in the forms of ATP and NADPH are put to work reducing the carbon atom in carbon dioxide to produce carbohydrates. The same kinds of carbohydrates that we oxidized in the previous chapter in cellular respiration. But before we get into it, there is something that you should be fully and clearly aware of. The Calvin cycle is not the citric acid cycle. Both are metabolic cycles, yes, and both start with C and end with cycle. But the Calvin cycle is part of photosynthesis, and you haven't heard much about it yet. The citric acid cycle is part of cellular respiration, and you know that it produces two-thirds of your carbon dioxide and NADH and FADH2. You should draw out the two cycles and compare them. One is catabolic, breaking down the bones of glucose and producing ATP, the citric acid one. And the other is anabolic, building up carbohydrates and consuming carbon dioxide, as well as great gooey gobs of ATP and NADPH. I will ask this about this on an exam. So, you have been informed. So, both are cycles, meaning they regenerate their starting materials as materials enter and leave. But the Calvin cycle performs an amazing feat, reducing the carbon atom of carbon dioxide to produce sugars. In the overview, I told you that glucose is not the sugar that is produced directly from photosynthesis. That title belongs to another carbohydrate called glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. This three carbon sugar has actually snuck into our slides twice already. The first time was back in chapter five when I told you about how simple carbohydrates, monosaccharides, can vary in the number of carbon atoms in their skeletons. See here? It's a three carbon aldose with a phosphate group. Don't look now, but there's, there's, no, there's another very important carbohydrate we are going to see in a couple of slides. Do you see it? We also saw G3P, because now we can use its nickname for glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, in the previous chapter on cellular respiration. You may be forgiven if you don't remember it from there, because it popped in at the middle of glycolysis. See it here, down here? It is one of the two 3-carbon products from breaking fructose in half en route to pyruvate it gets the energy payoff stage going, so it's really quite useful stuff. And that is the direct product from the Calvin cycle, G3P. In order to make it though, a plant needs to run the Calvin cycle three times, fixing three carbon dioxide molecules. The Calvin cycle has three phases for us to learn. Step one, carbon fixation, where carbon dioxide is added to an organic molecule, a reaction catalyzed by the enzyme Rubisco. Step two is reduction, or adding of electron power to that carbon atom, and this is where the sugar molecule steps out. And step three is the regeneration of the molecule that will be receiving the next molecule of carbon dioxide, which is called ribulose bisphosphate. So let me tell you a little bit about Rubisco. Um, have you ever heard of Ricardo Isaacson dos Santos Leite? On the soccer pitch, he is known as Kaka, which is a much handier nickname to have. Rubisco also has a long and complicated name, which is this mouthful, ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. This longer name is the familiar form that tells us what the substrates are and what the enzyme does. Ribulose bisphosphate is the substrate, and it carboxylases it and oxygenases it. Rubisco is touted as the most abundant enzyme in the world. And it's not like we can tell that by censusing cells and figuring out how many enzymes they have, but we know this to be true for two reasons. Number one, 
it is essential for producing carbohydrates in photosynthesis. And two, it's pretty bad at its job, so chloroplasts need an awful lot of it. We'll come back to this number two thing in just a minute. But Rubisco catalyzes the first step in the Calvin cycle, which is carbon fixation. In this diagram, you should note that three molecules of ribulose bisphosphate, or RUBP, are accounted for. This really just represents three turns of the Calvin cycle, which is what we need for one sugar molecule to be outputted. For each molecule of RUBP, one molecule of carbon dioxide is added by Rubisco. This produces a very unstable molecule with six carbon atoms. It is so unstable that it immediately breaks down into three carbon molecules called 3-phosphoglycerate. The fix is in, as they say. The carbon dioxide is back in an organic molecule, though not a particularly useful one. The second step is to jazz up the 3-phosphoglycerate adding potential energy in the best way we know how by phosphorylating it. This is energy coupling in action. Now, the 3-phosphoglycerate has not one but two phosphate groups on it, and we are ready to reduce that carbon atom from the carbon dioxide, restoring its potential energy with those powerful electrons from NADPH, which I'll say one more time is the fancy electron bus. Now we've got G3P, and if we fixed three molecules of carbon dioxide, one molecule of G3P can now be outputted to make other carbohydrates such as glucose. But we need to close the loop. We need step three, regeneration of RUBP, so it can fix more carbon dioxide. This step, has two parts of its own. One, reshuffling of the carbon atoms, so instead of five molecules with three carbons, we have three molecules with five carbons. And step two, we need to energize those five carbon molecules with more ATP. This gives us ribulose bisphosphate once again, and we are ready to accept more carbon dioxide. And the Calvin cycle keeps rolling along. To keep this cycle going, plants need a steady supply of carbon dioxide and also a steady supply of water. This presents a predicament. Plants can allow for gas exchange through the stomata on the leaves, as you may recall. Stomata over here. Carbon dioxide enters, oxygen leaves. Oxygen leaves the leaves. But the stomata also release water vapor. If they release too much water, we know that cells can plasmalize and die. That's no good, so plants can close the stomata if they're losing too much water. But this introduces a new problem because of course it does. Plants that live in very hot and very dry climates can't tolerate dehydration, so they'll close their stomata when conditions demand it. This means that water doesn't escape but it also means carbon dioxide can't get in and oxygen can't get out. At elevated oxygen conditions, plants start doing something stupid called photorespiration. And by stupid, I mean wasteful and unhelpful. Light is good. Respiration is good. But photorespiration is bad, bad, bad. What causes it? Remember, the full name of Rubisco is ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. The key to photorespiration is that last thing, oxygenase. Rubisco, at high oxygen concentration, will fix oxygen gas instead of carbon dioxide. This will consume oxygen and also ATP, but it produces no sugar. It does produce carbon dioxide, and this consumption of oxygen and production of carbon dioxide is why it's called respiration. But not producing any sugar makes this an inefficient process. So why does it happen at all? Because Rubisco first evolved at a time very, very long ago, billions of years ago in fact, when oxygen wasn't abundant in the atmosphere. 
So if a little oxygen got in the works, it wasn't a big deal. But as oxygen concentration increased in the atmosphere due to the evolution of Photosystem II, Rubisco didn't really change with the times. Most photosynthetic organisms coped by producing more Rubisco. So photorespiration just happened. <laughs>